From Transport Topics in Washington, D.C., this is Road Signs. Here is your host, Seth Clevenger. Thank you for listening to Road Signs, the podcast series from Transport Topics that explores the trends and technologies that are shaping the future of trucking. In this second roundabout episode, we're going to conclude our retrospective on automated trucking by revisiting past interviews with two more innovators in this emerging field. We're going to discuss level two automation designed to support rather than replace the driver, as well as the path to level four, where trucks would truly begin to drive themselves. Later in the program, we're going to revisit our recent conversation with Ogden Stoyanovsky, co-founder and chief operating officer at Pronto AI, a developer of driver assist technology. But first, we're going to return to our July 2018 interview with Chuck Price, vice president of product at self-driving truck startup Too Simple. Let's play that interview now. We're very excited to welcome a special guest who's involved in the development of self-driving commercial trucks. Chuck Price is vice president of product at Too Simple, a company that is testing automated commercial trucks in both the United States and China. Thanks for taking time out to speak with us, Chuck. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to it. Yeah, so today, Too Simple's trucks travel down the road with a safety driver behind the wheel and an engineer in the passenger seat while you continue to test and refine your automated driving technology. But let's talk about what this will look like in the end. Do you see Too Simple's trucks eventually driving themselves with no one on board? Or will they continue to have a driver inside as they operate autonomously? Or could we see a mixture of both of those scenarios? I I think we'll end up seeing a mixture of both. Um, We do uh, hope to advance the technology sufficiently that we can pull the driver out. Uh, That does require uh, some interaction with regulators. Uh, both at the state and federal level. Um, but even, even when we do reach that state, uh, there are uh, certain, certain classes of cargo that will uh, certainly always require a human uh, to be present. Mm-hmm. Um, high, value, high value cargo uh, especially will typically have a human and sometimes an, an armed human uh, present, uh, sometimes even more than one. So, uh, so we don't we don't think autonomy necessarily means uh, no humans. Um, so there are there are, there are a variety of scenarios. Okay, and too simple is uh, planning to uh, pursue or at least enable potentially both of those. We certainly are. Uh, our our systems will work in in trucks that have still have seats, and we. Uh, we are designing on the assumption that uh, even when it's a you know fully vetted autonomous vehicle, that that there could be a passenger inside. Sure. And of course, for autonomous trucks to be successful in the market, uh, they will have to provide a return on, on investment for fleets, right? You know, trucking companies aren't going to do this just because it seems cool. Uh, so, Chuck, I wanted to ask you uh, to. Spell out what you see as the potential cost savings offered by self-driving trucks, uh, both with and without a driver on board. What are the potential savings? Sure. Uh, There are both direct and indirect uh, operating cost savings. Um, The most most obvious, if you you do remove the driver, uh, that is potentially a 40% savings uh, from the top. Uh, But... In addition, we can save substantially in fuel. Um, the the most the most obvious fuel saving is just in operating the vehicle more efficiently. You know, with with softer softer accelerations and uh, minimizing braking. You know, planning better so that the vehicle stays at a constant speed. But less obvious is what happens if you. Uh, don't have to adhere to the hours of service rules. In that case, we can actually convert what would normally be rest brakes for a driver into slower speeds for the vehicle. In that way, we move the vehicle slightly more slowly to the destination, but we actually get there faster because we don't take all of the rest time. But that will save on the order of 15% in fuel when you do that. If you reduce speeds from, say, 65 to 55, you'll save 15% in fuel costs. And that's a very large number for fleets. Next, I wanted to also kind of talk a little bit more broadly about 
the pathway to autonomous trucking. I mean, we're talking about these possibilities. Uh, maybe we'll have driver assist technology. Uh, you know, maybe that that even gets to the point where the the truck is fully autonomous and there's a a driver still performing other functions in the truck. And maybe in some cases we can even get to uh, a driverless scenario. But I find that sometimes when I talk about the subject with people who are outside the trucking industry, I encounter what I think are unrealistic expectations about how quickly this will happen or uh, what it might mean driving jobs. And I'm sure you hear a lot of this stuff too. So I, I do feel the need to provide a little bit of a reality check you know, for this notion that the whole trucking industry is about to become automated overnight. So Chuck, I wanted to just pose that question to you. You know, what's your sense of how quickly this move toward automation will happen? And what are the, the real world implications uh, for truck driving jobs? I certainly don't think this is going to happen overnight. Um, we expect that we will be scaling regionally, uh, starting with individual states, uh, moving state to state. Uh, as the state regulators uh, open their, open their uh, access. I believe that even when we do uh, begin scaling up, there is such a driver shortage today that it will, I believe, will be years, if not decades, uh, until we reach the point that we're actually replacing a human driver's job with an automated driver. I believe, I believe what's going to happen is that first, this is going to fill the needs where drivers aren't available for vehicles. Uh, in the, in the, the near future, we're projecting 150,000 uh, driver shortage in the U.S. And that by itself is a business for us. Another aspect of uh, hours of service limits and, you know, the possibility of relaxing hours of service if you can operate a vehicle autonomously is how that might change distribution networks. So, Chuck, what are some of the ways we might see uh, transportation networks evolve if, if this does indeed become reality? Well, it's, 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 a, it's a highly disruptive change uh, that could potentially come in a, in a positive way. Um, when you're not restricted by how long a driver can drive in a day, you can, you can locate your distribution centers quite differently. Today, because of hours of service constraints, shippers or, or fleets typically uh, locate their distribution centers about a day's drive apart. That way, drivers can meet in the middle, exchange cargo, drive back to their, their home distribution center, and sleep in their own bed at night. With an autonomous vehicle without hours of service constraints, one could locate distribution centers at the limit of the vehicle's fuel capacity, which could be two or more days of movement. This could potentially eliminate half or more of your distribution centers. It could also speed the movement of, of traffic since uh, for long haul, if it takes you five days today to cross the country, you could cross the country in about 48 hours, which, which moves your, your freight movement uh, along uh, you know, nearly at the, at the speed of air movement, so at a much lower cost. So there are, there are dramatic changes that this could have in the distribution network that aren't represented in the in the operating the direct operating costs of moving one vehicle there's dramatic operating cost shift in the network itself no that's uh, that's important to keep in mind and i think that's that's helpful and you know as you guys move forward at too simple you know your company is taking an interesting approach i think to deploying self-driving technology so the plan is, you know, rather than, you know, right away providing your technology to trucking companies, you're starting out by operating your own fleet to prove out the concept before you start offering it as a, a commercial product. And can you tell us a little bit more, Chuck, about why you've chosen to take that approach to the technology? Sure. 
One reason is technical and safety. Um, in order to get a, a system like this accepted on the highway, you, you need to drive millions of miles. If, if we're doing that to prove the safety, we need to do it with our own fleet. We don't think it, it would be ethical to, to recruit some drivers off the street uh, with another fleet's vehicles and say, hey, go, go drive this around. Uh, so we'll do it ourselves. Uh, we are planning to build a fleet of 200 trucks next year. We believe with, with that number of trucks and with uh, shippers that we're, that we're engaged with to, to move real cargo, we'll be able to develop millions of miles very quickly on the highway. And we think, we think it's sort of a, it's sort of a eat, eat your own dog food kind of approach where we're going to be the first ones uh, through the gate working with shippers to understand how well we can integrate this with, with existing fleet operations. Our goal is to minimize disruption uh, in the negative sense, but maximize disruption in the positive sense uh, to make this to make this go forward. Okay. And, you know, Too Simple is in a unique position, I think, among some of the companies that are developing self-driving truck technology. And that is operating in two major markets. So the company has dual headquarters in Beijing and San Diego and is working to automate trucking in both the Chinese and U.S. markets. So, Chuck, I want to get your thoughts uh, looking ahead, you know, and and where we are today. How do those markets compare uh, in terms of interest and uh, investment in self-driving trucks? And uh, do you envision a you know sort of a competition emerging among different parts of the world to become the leader in automated trucking in the in the years and decades ahead? Sure, that's an interesting question. We we see the the problems existing in in both markets. Uh, there is a driver shortage uh, in the Chinese market as well. Um, in terms of uh, the market dynamics, it's, it's a little different uh, in some sense. In China, the, the cost of the driver is a smaller portion of the overall operating cost, so there are different dynamics. Fuel savings uh, is, is highly interesting there. The driver shortage is real. Uh, so so all, of the, all of the ingredients are present to make this uh, a high demand uh, thing in both markets. Um, in addition, uh, you touch on the, the other aspect of competition, the, the states themselves, the country, the two countries uh, and the major countries in the world are in competition to be the first with artificial intelligence based systems. China has, has, has a strategic plan to position itself as the number one in artificial intelligence. And the systems that we're building are heavily AI based. So there's a tremendous interest in China to see this company succeed. Um, we have a lot of visibility uh, in China. Um, I believe we're going to see similar uh, pressure uh, in the US as, as the US regulators continue to uh, advance advance their their regulatory uh, uh, strategies, um, and we think that eventually there is going to be a U.S. versus China AI competition. And with our feet in both markets, we think it can only help. Sure, and you'll you'll have a uh, you know, like you said, a foot in uh, on on both uh, continents and. It'll be interesting to see how this develops. You know, as a as a follow up, though, uh, maybe I could I could ask you just a a little bit more about your sense of where we stand in the U.S. market on uh, regulations. You know, this emerging regulatory framework for uh, automated commercial vehicles, and there's been some movement and a lot of discussion. Uh, what do you think about the path that we're on right now? I think there's a very healthy dialogue uh, that's going on between the regulators and the industry. Uh, so far, I've, I've seen nothing but, but positives regarding uh, our 
our work with the with the U.S. and the state level regulators. We are we're very tight with Arizona where we're testing. We're also very tight with the with the federal regulators. We have uh, constant dialogue with them. China is a little different in that their their regulatory structure obviously is is different the way they they run their state. Uh, but in China, there is very strong central government support for what's happening, and we have been granted uh, very generous permits uh, in the in the China region for testing. We're testing in multiple regions in China. We're testing in South ADN, which is a, a port region southeast of Beijing. We're also testing uh, in the Shanghai region, uh, and both both regions are are very positive about us us being present there. Ten everyday uses of transport topics on Alexa. One, while you get ready for work in the morning. Two, while you cook breakfast. Three, while you eat breakfast. Four, while you drive to work. Five, while you're at work. Six, while you eat your lunch. Seven, while you're driving home. Eight, while you cook dinner. Nine, while you eat dinner. Ten, while, well, let's face it, it's one minute with today's biggest industry headlines. The listening options are endless, so why be confined to 10? Simply say, okay, Google, talk to Transport Topics. We're here in San Diego at ATA's 2019 Management Conference and Exhibition, and I'm very excited to welcome Agnes Stoyanovsky, co-founder and chief operating officer at Pronto AI, a developer of automated driving technology for commercial trucks. Thanks for joining us, Ognan. Thanks very much for having me. Excited to be here. Now, Pronto's approach to automated trucks is quite different from some of the other self-driving truck startups that are out there testing on the road. This is strictly a driver assist system that supports but doesn't replace the driver. So why go that route instead of trying to push for higher levels of automation? We're trying to go that route, I mean, as a starting point because that's where the technology is today. So where we are with machine learning, artificial intelligence, whatever you want to call it, automation, we've had a lot of great demos, a lot of good progress has been made, especially over the last five years. Um, but the technology is still quite a ways away where an autonomous truck can operate driverless down the interstate. Um, so we could wait for that to become a reality someday and wait for the scientific breakthroughs, of which you know we're working on as well. But at the end of the day, the technology is at a state where it's good enough to be commercialized and provide some immediate value, not as a driver replacement tool, but as a driver retention, driver recruiting, and a safety tool as well. And so uh, that's, that's a real motivation, trying to do a real product for real customers today, given where the, sta the state of the technology actually is. Okay. And tell us a little bit more about how your co-pilot system works. You know, what can it do and what can't it do? Sure. So co-pilot, uh, in a nutshell, it brings to trucking something that passenger vehicles or at least high-end luxury passenger vehicles have had for a while, which is you know really, really good automatic emergency braking, um, full adaptive cruise control, uh, proactive lane centering, so the truck will steer and stay in the middle of the lane um, by itself. But what it won't do, what it what it is not, is a fully autonomous truck. This is, you know, in sort of industry jargon, a level two type system, which means it requires a fully attentive driver uh, at all times to supervise it. So, you know, it'll it will do throttle, braking, and steering um, on extended periods of time on the highways. It's a highway only system, so it won't work off 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 highways um, right now. Um, but it, again, given where trucks are um, off the lot right now, you know, they, they just don't quite have the same safety and comfort features that have existed in you know, really high-end passenger vehicles for a while now. We're trying to bring that kind of safety and that kind of comfort to uh, you know, some of the hardest working drivers, which is the truck drivers and not just you know, high-end consumers. Right. And as you said, Pronto's co-pilot system represents level two automated driving. And really, that means that there's automatic steering, braking, and acceleration. But it still requires a driver to remain engaged at all times. The driver is still driving. Uh, but your system doesn't just uh, require the driver to, uh, to monitor the road. It actively insists on it. So could you please explain how Copilot ensures that the driver doesn't just stop paying attention and go back in the sleeper berth and, and relax? And, you know, how, and why is that so critical? Well, it's critical because, like I said, the technology is not at a point where a driver can actually not pay attention and check out for a while or have a driverless truck or anything like that. So it's very important that people, when they first use the system, that they understand not just what the system can do, but also what it can't do, which is be operate safely while unsupervised. And so there's a few ways we try to go about that. 
Um, one of which is great, actually, the trucking industry is a great adopter of these technologies because unlike the consumer space where you maybe have gadget enthusiasts that want to sort of push the limits and think they have a really cool car and therefore maybe pretend they have a robot car before they really do, in trucking we have driver training requirements, uh, good education, so I think working with fleet safety managers, um, with fleet owners, with the drivers themselves, uh, there's a really critical training component to it that I actually has been lacking, I think, in the passenger vehicle space, which is why there's been so, some issues there with, with this level of technology. And I think trucking is really well positioned to capture the benefits while avoiding some of those potential pitfalls because it is somebody on their job working for their livelihood, so they take it potentially more seriously than maybe even you and I do when we just run errands around town. Um, and uh, there's no substitute for good training and good safety training, which this industry has really good practices that we can just plug into and add this in. So that's the operational uh, piece of how we right. ensure that it's properly used. Then there's a technological component to it too, which is a bit of a you know driver monitoring type system where you you want to 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 we have an inward facing camera. And again, this is sort of flexible exactly how it works. We're in early days. We can talk about that if you want. But the, the, the basic way to approach it is, at least in these early days, is to make sure. Um, we, we, we track to make sure cell phones are not being used um, and that the driver is in the seat and, um, and you know, paying attention, uh, forward-looking at all times. Yeah, watching the road and, and yeah. performing, you know, typical yeah. mirror checks and, and, do, and yeah. doing the job of yeah. driving. So the there's, a, there's a technical component to it. There's a, you know, a camera, a technological piece to it. But again, like I said, I think a lot of it comes down to actually an operational solution, which is working with great drivers and working with great fleets, being selective about who we work with and, and doing that safety training before we, before we put it out on the roads. So I was able to go for a ride along in one of your trucks a couple months ago in Virginia and you know one aspect of the system that really stood out to me was the safe landing feature. So if a driver is unresponsive for a certain amount of time, the truck will actually slow down and, and pull over to the side of the road automatically. Uh, so it's a really interesting safety net in the case the driver becomes incapacitated for some reason or simply uh, doesn't pay attention and stops driving. Uh, why is that such a significant step for a, a system like yours? Yeah, well, we were really excited to show you that. Thanks again for coming out. Um, yeah, safe landing is a feature that we're really excited about. And I just want to be clear, you know, that's still um, in the early days. It's it's really moving the whole industry along. So I mentioned Copilot. Um, the existing functionality is comparable to what we've seen in some luxury vehicles. But this doesn't exist anywhere, right? Nobody's been able to do safe landing so far, whether it's in the um, passenger vehicle, luxury car space, or anywhere else. Right? The ability to actually recognize that a driver is not responsive um, detect a, a shoulder and then pull over and safely stop, that's that's groundbreaking, right? We think that's a game changer as far as making sure that we capture all the potential safety benefits without without taking some unnecessary risks. Um, you know, that is not something that we'll be able to put on all roads in all conditions, just to be clear, all at once. Um, at its core system, Copilot, if there's an undetected driver, it will just put on the hazards and come to a stop. But increasingly, we're trying to develop a system that we work on uh, to have the functionality we showed you. We're in, in you know, initially limited settings on certain freeways, but over time, it's more and more. Uh, we will be able to detect a clear shoulder ahead, and if it's safe enough to do so, pull over and stop. And it doesn't just do it immediately, right, to be clear. Right. There's a series of increasing alarms that give the driver a chance to re-engage, uh, to take over, to show that they are indeed alert, just in case maybe the system was wrong and thought they were unresponsive when they were. But if, you know, after a certain time has elapsed and increasing alarms and you experience them, they get pretty loud and annoying. If somebody's <laughs> still not taking over at that point, uh, it's probably safest for the vehicle to come to a stop, whether that means coming to a stop in the lane or pulling over if there's a, if there's space and it's safe enough to do so. Sure. So one more uh, nuts and bolts question about how your system works. You know, today you're, you're retrofitting your, your technology on existing trucks. Uh, explain how that works and also how what you see as the pathway toward uh, a factory fit version of the technology. Sure. Um, I mean, an initial point for commercialization is through aftermarket retrofits, which you know, trucking is great for that because there's a well-established process. Um, but ultimately, you know, OEM integration is something we're interested in doing, we think we'll be able to do. Uh, it's it's really where we're neutral to it. There's a large segment of the carriers that buy trucks directly from dealerships and from, you know, from the OEMs, and there's many, many carriers that buy secondhand trucks. And so we wanted to be able to possible to serve uh, that entire segment rather than wait for the whole brand new fleet to turn over. Uh, so for some, some, some folks, Piloting our technology as an aftermarket retrofit will be good, but then actually scaling it, they'll want to do through an OEM. For others, they'll want to just actually do an aftermarket retrofit so that they can maybe 
uh, get the latest features, the best safety features, without having to buy a brand new truck with all the other bells and whistles that maybe maybe are not right for their fleet, right? So if they just prioritize, if they just want the latest, greatest safety tech without needing to buy a new truck. Um, so you know, trucking's you know very fragmented, as you know. Right. And so we're trying to serve as many aspects of it as possible. And the initial entry point is aftermarket retrofits, but we'll see where it goes. Very good. Now, you're already in the process of installing these systems on trucks operated by some of your early customers. Can you tell us a little bit more about where you are right now in the commercialization process of Copilot? Um, so, I mean, like I said, that's where we are. We're in the early days of starting to put our tech onto some customers' trucks um, and getting it out there. We've had, you know, a number of customers, you, you know, we've been uh, traveling the country. We've actually driven through all over 48 states. Our tech works on highways everywhere in six Canadian pro provinces. Um, Soon to be, soon to be, forty-nine states actually, um, and uh, but but you know that's you know we're not announcing any of our customer partnerships yet. Um, it's still early days, you know. It's 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 initial testing. Uh, we're really trying to get customer feedback uh, so that we can finalize the feature set for the mass market solution, which we'll be rolling out um, afterwards. And so the question is, we're trying to make a product not that we're pushing and trying to convince people that this is the feature set you want. It's more. Uh, trying to get feedback from these early customers. What is the thing, what is the killer app of our system that actually adds the most value to their business right now? And that might mean adding some features that we're thinking of as sort of in betas as prototyping, including safe landing as we demo to you. Does that make a really big difference for them? Should we make that standard for everybody? Or is it potentially even stripping away some features and making it simpler than it is right now in these early versions? Because um, I'll tell you, especially say, um, say on the steering side, some people really like the idea of proactive automated steering. Other customers um, maybe aren't as interested in the steering mm -hmm. itself. They might want just the great uh, predictive automated emergency braking and uh, adaptive cruise control while wanting their drivers to do the full steering. And so it could actually go either way. We might add features or we might sort of take some away. And so that's where we are, trying to get that feedback so that hopefully it's a, it's a pull of fleets demanding the features that actually move the needle on safety and driver recruitment for them uh, versus us finalizing the feature set, having it fixed, and then just trying to walk the hall here and sell as many as I can. <laughs> sure. No, we'll definitely stay tuned and, and uh, watch the rollout as it continues. Um, at Pronto, you're developing self-driving technology that's geared specifically toward commercial trucks. Now, prior to this venture, you helped launch self-driving truck startup Auto that many people remember from the partnership with uh, Anheuser-Busch. Uh, you also uh, worked on uh, Uber Freight, you know, which is the digital freight matching business at Uber. Uh, which is still why, doing it really well. Yes, it is. It's, and we're <laughs> watching that, for that. Uh, uh, closely uh, as well. Uh, but uh, why have you uh, focused your attention on the trucking industry? You know, why do you see this industry as such a significant opportunity for technology? I think trucking is great because this is the industry where, where the technology is, where driving, you know, safe driving software technology is. It's the most straightforward and highest value add commercialization opportunity right now. Um, like I said already, the aftermarket um, retrofit path is a viable one in trucking. There's many companies, including at this conference, that are going that route. Um, trucks are very individually spec'd when fleets order them, so they can customize it exactly the way they want it. You know, the automotive um, segment is just different, right? There's a standard make and model that, you know, we can maybe add a sports package or a navigation package, but it's pretty much an out-of-the-box solution. Whereas in trucking, fleets are very careful about, and there's, you know, real science to it about how they, how they spec their trucks, and as a result, you can really implement these kind of technologies directly to the end user and the customer and, and make it something that they really want and, and add value to them. And it's a business proposition, right? Like I said, it's not a introducing technology where it's sort of a gadget and a cool gadget. It's not just a cool factor, it's an actual business proposition. Mm -hmm. So I think the business to business nature of it uh, is really attractive in, in right. trucking and that's that's what made me excited and you know made me take that turn, uh, I guess now uh, over three years, three and a half years ago when, when we started Auto and now with uh, Pronto. Transport topics in one word, authoritative. Knowledge, outstanding. Reliable. We asked Transport Topics readers to describe us in one word. Informative. Informative. Integrity. The Bible. Authoritative. The authority. Transportation information, that's two, but I, I, I gotta have it both. Physically large. Yes. <laughs> well, that's two words. Visit influence.ttnews.com forward slash say hello to find out what they're talking about. Ogden, you personally have been working with self-driving vehicle technology much longer than that, you know, going back to, I believe, 2004 with the first DARPA challenge. 
Uh, so really, what first attracted you to this form of technology? You know, why did you decide to really dedicate your career to self-driving vehicle technology, and, and what was it about this, the potential that really yeah. got you into this? I, I'd love to say I, I had a grand vision during the grand <laughs> challenge as a 21-year-old at the time. I mean, perfectly honestly, it was just a cool engineering project while I was in grad school initially, right? right? It was, um, you know, my friends, um, you know, d deciding to enter this competition. I wasn't the one that decided to join them. Had a lot of fun doing it. Um, and then over the years, it kind of turned out it's a real thing that might have a real customer. And, and it took a while, right? I mean, I'd be... Uh, it wouldn't be true to sit here, you know, sit here and say, you know, oh, it, it's working out exactly like we thought. And, you know, there's been a lot of predictions and timelines when we're going to have driverless vehicles. We've been right about some things. We've made a lot of progress over the last 15 years. And frankly, we've been wrong about some things and underestimated some challenges or the way the business model was going to go. Um, but the reason I'm still in it is, I mean, it's endlessly fascinating, yeah. right? Um, and you get to work with industries like I, I didn't imagine when we built that self-driving motorcycle in 2004 that I'd be working in truck, trucking 15 years later or be at this <laughs> conference um, but it's fun right yeah. you, you get those interesting career turns and just kind of going with an industry as it's from non-existence to an actual right we're now at the point where it's finally starting to become a real yeah. a real business right it, it was it, it's been a series of very cool R&D projects and demonstrations and now I'm super excited because it's it's actually a business where you have real customers yeah and you know part of the process of, of truly making this a business and commercializing it and, and deploying it is to gain public acceptance uh, from the, you know, the motoring public and also from regulators and legislators. Uh, can you speak to how Pronto has been working to make sure that government and law enforcement and the public understand the technology and they don't become barriers to its deployment? Yeah, well, I think that's key. Um, you know, it used to be, and we didn't do ourselves many favors as an, as an industry, where some years ago we were over-enthusiastic about where the state of technology really is and sometimes even saying things like, well, if the regulations were in place, then we could have you know, all these amazing autonomous vehicles tomorrow. That, that's just not where the tech is. And I think uh, you know, Secretary Chow has called for you know, strong engagement uh, with the public and with regulators. And, I, and law enforcement is really a critical part of it, right? Because they see, they see a lot of the downside of, of, of you know, a lot of crashes in their careers. They've, a lot of state troopers come up through the through the through the ranks, seeing the worst of the worst as far as crashes. And I think it's critical in us as an industry to not just talk about safety platitudes and the potential for how safety can be increased through automation, because of course that's true in some theoretical sense. But if you to actually capture it and to realize it in public, you have to work within the established system, and that means mm. with law enforcement, with regulators, with the industry, and with the public, because autonomous vehicles and even just um, you know, advanced driver assist systems like Pontos, they're not, they're not being deployed in a vacuum. They're not being deployed in special lanes or special infrastructure that's just for them. We're deploying automation slowly in a very human-centric and well-established driving ecosystem. And to do that, and to do that successfully, uh, you know, we have to we have to work with everybody. The, yep. the established cycle. That's why you know we at Pronto see motor carriers as our customers, not as our competitors. That we're out there to disrupt. We're out there to disrupt software and technology, not not the whole underlying freight supply chain or anything like that. Yep. And yeah, well, speaking of this topic, uh, just yesterday at this conference, FMCSA Administrator Ray Martinez announced a new initiative to help promote the safety benefits of ADAS, which is Advanced Driver Assist Systems, uh, if, you, if you spell out the alphabet soup there. Right. Uh, but, Ogden, what are your thoughts on how the industry can promote adoption of active safety systems? You know, there's a lot on the market now, and it's just getting more and more sophisticated, but that doesn't mean that adoption is, is moving rapidly in all cases. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on how the industry can really move the needle on, on that? Yeah, I'm really, really excited about what Administrator Martinez announced. Uh, can't wait to find out more in the, in the coming days and, and weeks and months. I think, I think that in itself, right, government stating, FMCSA stating that the road to safety has always been a road of improving technological advancements, right? And so this evolutionary approach that the administration has embraced to start improving and adding more and more advanced driver assist systems, not through a mandate, but rather just encouraging industry to take a look, try it out, see if it's a good fit. Some things will, will work, like I said, for certain fleets, others won't. And and I think the way the industry should do it is just, you know, not, not sit around and wait necessarily for the OEMs to offer a complete finished product, but rather be out there, try different features, try Prontos, try our competitors, try what the OEMs have, and then, and then just give everybody feedback. And I think it's critical to get drivers trying these technologies out on a limited basis, right? You know, we shouldn't be rolling out millions of units overnight, but 
driver should have a chance to try it. Safety managers should have a chance to try it uh, directly, put it in their everyday business operations, and then set feedback. Um, and it's a huge range of features, right? Like some things will be right for some fleets and others won't. I'd be very curious to know what ADAS means for this initiative because a lot of things are labeled, like you said, in the alphabet suit ADAS. Uh, take steering, for example, right? ADAS can mean anything from just a visual or an audio alert that there's a lane departure. That's a type of steering ADAS. It can mean something where if the vehicle starts to depart, it nudges you back into the center of the lane, you know, kind of pushes you a little bit uh, back in, but doesn't steer for you all the time. Or it can be something like Pronto system where it's continually keeping you in the center of the lane and actually doing the steering on an extended period of time. All of those are some sort of steering ADAS, and I hope they're all included in, in what's yeah. studied, but they shouldn't necessarily be all lumped together in the same bucket because there's different variations on ADAS, there's different safety benefits to different types, and they're probably specific to different kind of lanes, different kind of operations. Um, so, so we'll see. We're we're very excited about the initiative overall. Yeah, eager. We're, we're eager at TT to to learn more about uh, exactly what this entails as well. Uh, you know, here at this conference, you know, some of the other big topics of discussion have been proposed changes to driver hours of service rules, uh, industry workforce development. We're constantly hearing about uh, you know fleets that would just love to hire more drivers if they could only find them. Uh, infrastructure improvement is a, is certainly a continuing topic of conversation. Uh, what are some of the, uh, the topics that are interesting you while you're here? You know, what are some of the conversations that you've been having at, at the show? Yeah, I think it's the ones you outlined. Obviously, first and foremost, it's, it's the announcement you already mentioned from Administrator Martinez. Uh, but the workforce development issues, I think, are huge because we are, we're trying to build a safety product that's not just a safety product, but also one that drivers love. And so the workforce development, Recruiting and retention, which you know, I'm always amazed when I come to these conferences. They're, they're two very different things, right? Driver recruitment versus driver retention. They get lumped in together, and I think there's different ways in which we can be part of the solution. Hopefully, uh, so talking about that, hours of service is an endlessly interesting one, and I know everybody has a side in that fight and old battle, battle wounds. And maybe I'm sort of late coming <laughs> to this game in, the tra in tracking the last few years. I, you know, I don't sort of necessarily have a dog in that fight, but I do think. Um, different kinds of driver assist systems, different kind of technologies as they're being integrated on trucks more and more, that should be taken into account into whatever whatever changes are made on hours of service. So hours of service. And I think there's recognition uh, in that by all the stakeholders, the safety advocates, the motor carriers, the administration themselves. So I'm confident that sort of folks will consider what either increased automation or other technologies mean and the kind of implications they have for the hours of service reform. Um, but I don't necessarily have a particular side or right. as far as you know split times or anything like that and <laughs> sure. I'm advocating I'm just I'm just glad they're considering it and, yep. and 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 you know there's an ongoing conversation about it so mostly for me that's something I'm interested in but that's something I'm interested in learning about so that I can see if we can be a part of the solution there as opposed to me um, advocating for a particular position sure and then just a final question I'll, I'll leave you with Ogden uh, you know, sort of the crystal ball question I love to, to end on. You know, how do you see automated driving technology in trucking evolving in the years ahead? You know, how do you envision uh, the role of the driver and the role of automated driving technology in 5, 10, and 20 years from now? So I definitely have my own opinions on that um, that I could share. And, uh, but I want to be careful because you know, three years ago I thought things were going to be quite different than they yeah, actually are right. today. Um, but what I'll, what I'll give a quick plug to is, you know, this kind of question about what, how is this going to look, how is automation going to be integrated into trucking, that's actually the subject of a, of a research grant that just got awarded to the Virginia Tech Transportation Institute, uh, I think just two weeks ago, that we'll be participating in as a technology provider. Um, I don't want to get ahead of myself here, you know, they'll be releasing, Virginia Tech will be releasing a lot more details about it in the, uh, in the weeks ahead. But I think that's a great opportunity for motor carriers to actually get involved, work with us, work with Virginia Tech, and, and try to see what is this, how can you actually integrate these technologies into viable business operations. Not just can you do a technology demo to in the abstract say this is scientifically possible, but rather how can you actually integrate these things into your future commercial operations. So it's a really a business model oriented study of what the future uh, could look like. And so, you know, if anybody listening to this is a motor carrier and wants to get involved, they should reach out to me or to Virginia Tech and we can try to answer that crystal ball question together rather than me offering you my personal opinions because, you know, uh, I have some strong opinions about what I think it's going to look like, but, uh, but I'm, not, I'm not willing to make a bet about what 10 years from now is going to look like. Yes, yeah, the, the crystal ball is still pretty hazy uh, to be sure, but uh, it'll be 
uh, certainly fascinating to, to watch how this all develops. And, you know, this has been a great conversation, you know, lots of insights, but uh, I think that's a good stopping point. Uh, so I just want to thank you again for joining us, Ogden. We really appreciate you taking the time out. I appreciate you having me. From time to time, an issue commands so much of the industry's attention that it requires a deeper dive, a resource readers can turn to, a Transport Topics special report. In 2019, we produced two. One, on the rising tide of electric trucks that are promising to reshape how goods are moved down the road. We also examined trends in trucking and insurance, with particular focus on how new technologies help motor carriers eliminate risk and how this is influencing insurers' underwriting practices. I'm Joe Howard, Executive Editor here at Transport Topics, and I invite you to learn more about our special reports and reserve your copy of the next one at ttn.ws slash special. Over the last few years, we've seen a great deal of investment and testing of automated driving technology for commercial trucks. Although highly automated trucks often grab the spotlight, there's a lot happening right now in advanced driver assistance systems as well. Automated steering capabilities are starting to become available, marking a new phase in the development of driver assist capabilities. At the same time, technology developers continue to make progress in their mission to make self-driving trucks a reality. We are still in the early miles on the long road to automated trucking, but as time goes on, this technology will continue to advance, and we'll see it enter our industry in many different forms. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please let others know. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. If my questions have sparked questions of your own, share them with me and the Road Signs team. You can email us at share at ttnews.com. We'll read them and respond daily. Until next time, I'm Seth Clevenger. Thank you for listening. 